My name is Joseph Wunderlich. I'm a professor of engineering, architecture, and computer science. This is part three of a seven-part series, lecture series on architecture design theory. Here are the seven parts, and this is on form and space. Uh, you can find uh, PPTX up with audio and MP4 and YouTube and PDF versions of uh, these lectures at these links. These are the sources. Um, the main uh, course textbooks um, is a Frank Lloyd Wright book on the natural house and, uh, and uh, with reference to a lecture series that I've finalized pretty much in 2018 uh, after teaching related material for a while. And then uh, most importantly in this course, the Qing textbook on architecture, form, space, and order. So firstly, um, form and space. We organize in the positive shapes and negative backgrounds, and then we grow elements uh, around them. Um, <clears throat> and so the background and the foreground uh, is a unity of opposites. So we think of both both the positive and negative space. Um, and form occurs, uh, occurs at the junction between mass and space. Uh, I see the mass contained uh, containing a volume of space as well as the form of the volume itself. So for example, um, you look at this uh, floor plan, this footprint, and the relationship of the mass and space exists at several scales, uh, not only form but its impact on space. And then uh, we're talking about architecture and uh, urban space, urban design. So at an urban scale, a building is part of the fabric defining uh, streets and squares or in uh, plan view here you can see it's standing alone um, <clears throat> and then we read the walls as elements and the space in between should uh, not be simply background for the walls but also forms so you really want to look at the negative space as well as the positive space so we'll start with the basic elements of, uh, <clears throat> of the form and so we have a ground plane or, uh, and the floor plane, not always the same thing, uh, typically not. So the elevation of the, of the site um, and, the, and the terrain of the site and how it, that's graded versus the floor plane of the structure. And the way these planes uh, relate, so the elevated or sunken planes, um, uh, the elevated plane separates from surroundings and creates a, a domain with a larger spatial context. Uh, and the vertical edges help. And then the sunken plane, that's a different effect. And uh, defines a volume of space isolated from a larger context. And then the plane um, overhead defines a volume of space beneath. So the tree, a canopy, you can imagine that. So in site design, um, the surface articulation of the ground or floor plane is often used in architecture to find a zone of space within a larger context. So you see the paths, uh, the paths of movement and the places of rest. Uh, we learn in urban design about paths and nodes and edges and, uh, and landmarks and districts. Um, and then um, uh, the field from which the form of a building rises out of the ground. Uh, so. Um, your your topography, your site, uh, it certainly relates to the to the building. And then in, on the interior, in the last slide here, uh, articulate the functional zone uh, if within a one room living room, uh, with the, uh, uh, the way the carpet is situated. So now in site design. We want to think about the terrain and how we're placing our form, our building. Um, it can be embedded into the earth. Uh, you know, frankly, Wright would want to do that. Um, the Taliesin, the, the brow uh, of the of the of the of the site of the hill. Don't destroy the the hill by putting the building on top. He would say. Um, in the second one, you could reform the topography topology of the site with your cut and fill. Uh, a, Standing tower marks a position in space. You can bridge across the space. You can uh, 
uh, terrace, uh, expand the ground plane and use those planes to your purpose. You can extend yourself way out and appear in the space um, or stand free like a pavilion in a meadow. So, for example, uh, here's the ground plane penetrating a buffer against undesirable conditions. An earthen structure with a green roof. With terracing, your ground plane can be elevated to establish a podium. Uh, your ground plane can be cut into um, the, the earth, into the site, uh, to honor a uh, sacred or significant place. could be terraced here. Um, this is San Francisco where I lived in the uh, late 1980s. Um, renovated a little Victorian across the street. Uh, worked as a consulting engineer. Uh, also started in high tech as a physics grad. Taught astronomy while in San Francisco. Uh, this is in the Presidio Heights. Um, just over the hill there you can see the Golden Gate Bridge. is the San Francisco Bay. The yellow circle is where I lived. See the uh, terracing of the ground plane. The project across the street from where I lived. Uh, you can, the ground plane can step to allow changes in elevation easily traversed. The Spanish steps in Rome. Beautiful, beautiful place. All of Rome. Been to Italy six times. Avoided Rome until later on and uh, I thought it would be a big kind of noisy city but it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, it, it's, it's isolated into little neighborhoods and pockets of uh, extreme beauty. This is in Hawaii. Uh, I did not take this picture uh, but I've been, been to Hawaii a number of times, <clears throat> Maui and Kauai and Oahu several times. A floor plane can be rendered as a natural or as a neutral ground against which other elements in space are seen as figures. So as a backdrop to accentuate uh, the figures, the sculptures in this case. Uh, the floor plane can be sunken down um, and it creates a different effect uh, whether it's uh, isolating or down below here if down, down uh, the hole or if it's something just uh, shallow depth you can sit on the edge of it and see at the top so sunken living room is an example that you might want to do for the effect you're going for in your design. This is a library, something very similar to a library that uh, when I was in the 70, 1970s, they tore down an old historic library. I wasn't very happy about it. But they built a hemicircle, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, inspired kind of design, and uh, I found an old plans and the, and the new plans in the old building and um, uh, that's one of my early inspirations in architecture so library the old library actually more than the new one but then the new one also in the 1970s and 60s actually born in 61 uh, sunken living room so you see the effect here right? if it was any deeper it'd be a hole it wouldn't be uh, part of space but this works well. You want to think of the sun angles all the time, orchestrating the sun, right? Part of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's organic design as well as good solar design in general for uh, uh, the, the Chinese in the 6th century or the Romans 2,000 years ago worrying about the sun angles um, as well as present day lead, uh, leadership and energy and environmental design uh, certifications and so you think about the sun and where the light will go. You get too deep of a hole, light's not really getting in there or the views. But if you if you make the expanse enough, you know, it will get in. 
Here's an amphitheater in Greece on a sunken ground plane 2,400 years ago. And so now elevating the plane and the effects that you can get there. Uh, so first you're, you're up, up high, the uh, person sitting up high, uh, the edge of the field is well defined, visual spatial continuity maintained, physical access is easily accommodated. You can walk up there. Uh, so you can think about that. The steps are too steep, but if you've ever been in a stadium where the steps are too steep, it'll give you vertigo, first of all, if you're an upper deck. It does for me. Uh, but there's a, there's a scale, a proportion that works, and then one that doesn't. Uh, so let's talk about this, the second one, vision, uh, maintaining visual continuity also makes a difference um, in, in, the, in the perception of the space. And then lastly, you know, visual and spatial continuity is interrupted if you're up uh, too high. So you realize now this is a whole separate floor. So the difference between split levels uh, and how that works psychologically, architecturally, and then when you want a separation by floors, you do that by design. So uh, now elevated planes, you can do that for a purpose here, uh, ceremonial spaces. Here's an elevated plane in uh, Kyoto, took this picture and it's intentional here uh, for a sacred space. Uh, here's another one, Emperor's Palace, Emperor's Seat of Honor. Uh, this is common in altars to uh, uh, raise the space, raise the plane. And here's just an example of where my wife and I got married in 1988. Uh, we met in 86 at University of California, San Diego. I was urban design uh, major. <clears throat> I just finished working several years for developers, uh, managing all the architecture, engineering, and construction of $100 million of uh, real estate development in uh, Texas and California, and then decided to go into uh, urban planning, urban design. I uh, worked as a urban planner for San Diego County as, uh, while I was going to school for approximately two years. I almost finished the second degree, but then decided to go into grad school. I finished with 200 credits of architecture and urban design before I ever started getting into high tech. But anyway, uh, so now the, the roof plane, the overhead plane can be a roof, shelters, the interior. Uh, it can be not a solid surface. So arbors, that's a great effect, especially in the warm climates. In California, this is very common. You want to be outside or the lanai, the outside porch in Hawaii. Uh, you want to block the direct sunlight, but uh, still create a space by virtue of the overhead plane. So arbors, trellises, pergolas, uh, sunlight and breeze gets through. Talk about this in the green architectural engineering course I teach and the passive heating and cooling. Let the air through as well as good airflow ventilation. Uh, not a bad idea even when there's uh, in winter time and diseases and things, viruses, right? Uh, roof plane can emerge with, uh, with the walls to emphasize the volume of the building mass. We do massing models in architecture and, uh, and this is what you see, what you get, you see the, the relationship between adjacent buildings and the overall form uh, and how it impacts the fabric of the urban design. Uh, they can, roof plane can be uh, considered like a hat on the building, articulates the space underneath. Uh, it can be expressed as a single sheltered form that encompasses a variety of spaces within the canopy. So this this is common. You don't see this in the United States much, but we stayed in Kyoto for a couple of weeks, my son and I, and uh, this is a common thing to do in Japan. You just declare a street a shopping street, no cars, put an overhead roof over it, and you've got essentially a mall. It actually works better, in my opinion, than the, the separate shopping mall that you drive to because it's in the fabric of the community already. It was part of this little neighborhood we stayed in Kyoto. Now, that's not this specific picture. I probably could insert a picture of that here. Probably should. And so, yes, I have inserted a slide here of the shopping street in Kyoto. 
uh, in the neighborhood we stayed at for approximately two weeks. And you can uh, find links to it in PowerPoint with audio and MP4, uh, YouTube, and PDF. Um, and then you'll see on here some key words uh, given to me by uh, my friend Mahua Bhattacharya, a colleague, a professor of Japanese. And uh, uh, these are key words uh, that uh, I'm discussing in this lecture. You can go and see more here. So I would say for this one, uh, so I, I have not all the keywords she gave me, uh, but the ones that I think apply to this slide. So being considerate of each other and the, and the, the space. The Japanese are very much aware and very much considerate of the personal space between each other. Uh, even in Tokyo, when it gets super crowded and you're jammed in the subways, I, I was jammed in a, not Tokyo, but in a, a Osaka. Uh, it, 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 yeah, it was a soccer, but um, yeah, it, it, the very considerative space, and then empathy, you know, feeling each other's pain and emotions, uh, in, insider and outsider, uh, yes, but you'd be polite about it, you won't be a Japanese person when you visit Japanese, uh, Japan, unless you are Japanese, um, native Japanese, and so that, that you do feel, but it's not in, a, not a, in an adversarial way. Uh, modesty, certainly, uh, you don't want to be too prideful and boastful and loud. Be humble, too. Just try to speak some Japanese. And then show some restraint. So um, as I'm passing this woman here sweeping, I'm very much aware that she's cleaning this space and that I don't want to you know, trample on what she's doing or even get in her space in any way. So I'm not moving fast or abrupt, and I, I think she uh, appreciated that. And this is the shopping street. You see it's covered and uh, it functions great. Everything you'd actually need day to day. Uh, so um, <clears throat> this is uh, something you might want to come back to in the Japanology. Uh, if you've been in my courses before, you know that NHK Tokyo Japanese channel, Japanology and Japan, uh, Japanology plus one, that they're really, uh, uh, really good. Uh, things to watch. And this is a particular exercise in the architecture theory uh, course. If you're watching this lecture and part of another course, uh, you don't need to do this, but in architecture theory course, we do. For roofs, we're talking about roofs now, roof planes. And so they examine the different kinds of roofs. Roofs, these are British roofs. Look at the Japanese type roofs. In this offering of uh, this course, this one offering, uh, we had specification writing for the uh, number of students, uh, specifically the engineers in there, and, and uh, we adhered to the master format, uh, the Construction Specifier Institute, also adapted by AIA and that, uh, typically uh, American Institute of Architects. And uh, and these are the 16 original divisions uh, that um, I was used to in my youth, and then everything switched to the more uh, specified, more uh, divided uh, into more sections, more divisions. Uh, which is now the standard everybody uses. So to the forms, now we're talking about the, the planes and the, and the overhead planes, defining the space below. Uh, you can see how that works with a, a curved space and how that relates to the space below. Uh, it's not just a structural thing, it's defining the space within. And you can manipulate those spaces, of course. In your design, whether you're doing trusses or joists, steel joists, or uh, masonry vault, you can see how the, each of these different uh, overhead planes, ceiling planes, define the spaces below. You can also sense the structure above and what the form will look like outside of the space. Uh, this is a picture from Venice. I've been there four times, I've been in Italy six times, taught at the University of Trento in Trentino Alta, uh, and also a relationship with the Pantheon Institute in Rome. Uh, there's six different schools of relationship with, but a very good relationship uh, with two of those universities. And Venice is my favorite place to go. My son took this picture, and he went with me twice. I think 2014, maybe, he took this picture. Uh, and then my son took this picture. This is Belgium, Mons. Uh, my, my uncle ran a, uh, a lab there, EMP lab for NATO uh, shape, Supreme Quarter, Headquarters, Allied Powers Europe. 
Uh, my aunt, this is my aunt Barbara. She's a professional ballerina in the Royal Ballet, or she was. I uh, taught ballet to, to the uh, people that work in NATO. Uh, this is the Sistine Chapel, and uh, this uh, I didn't take this picture this out of the book, but this is worth uh, spending some time. It certainly defines the space, and you go in just to, I sat in there for over an hour just watching people, essentially, as well as the space. Um, the ceiling can make a big difference. Uh, this is uh, in Frank Lloyd Wright, Oak Park, uh, his home and studio. Uh, this is... Uh, talked about this before and it's, it's certainly worth a visit and the tour guide was excellent there. Uh, this picture is taken from the balcony uh, and looking down where the, the children, six children he had would put on plays, people would watch. There's a piano below the balcony built into uh, over the stairwell beneath and the music would flow throughout the house. Uh, this is a picture of me and uh, my, my son Joseph took in um, <clears throat> Windsor, Old Windsor, uh, England. We were presenting a paper there uh, in London. This is a, a boys' school, uh, boarding school, converted into a hotel. Let's see how that defines the space. Uh, this is in uh, Padua, outside of Venice, uh, certainly a place to watch, uh, to, to see in itself. Uh, I have now good friends, uh, a professor friend and his wife, also a professor, live, uh, live in Padua. And I, at first I was a little reluctant to go because I just kept wanting to go back to Venice. I've been there four times, I just want to see more Venice. But they convinced me to stay for a while. Uh, and it was great. It's an experience in itself. Every city in, Ro in Italy is an experience in itself. But I highly recommend Padua, Padova, Italy. It's a picture in Kyoto with my son. Um, I was presenting as a keynote speaker there for an hour. My son was also on the stage because he contributed to the to the work. Um, <clears throat> and you see the detail here. Not, not only in the form and the shape, but look at how this is built. I mean, that makes you think about it and makes you feel that space. It kind of propels you through it in a spiral-like way. Very difficult way to lay brick like this. I think they did it purely for architectural reasons. I don't see a real structural benefit. This, there's a railroad track above. Uh, it certainly needs to hold up a lot of load. Uh, but I'd have to think of the structural analysis here to, to assert that this adds to the structural ability of it. I would think it would create stress concentrations. The more you, you want to uniformly distribute the loads typically, especially in a dynamic load of a railroad engine going either way above. Uh, but this is beautiful regardless. Oh, this is a picture of my wife in 1992, took her to Paris for her birthday, and then visited my uncle in Belgium. Then, uh, again, the previous picture was more recently with my son. Uh, my wife and I, we didn't have children. My son was born in 97, so this is 92. Uh, we were married in 98, or 88. And so you see this is Zell. This is on the Mosul River, uh, tributary to the Rhine, feeds to the Rhine, and uh, Berg Elts, big castles right there. Uh, it's, this is that's, the Mosul Valley is beautiful. It's a vine, uh, vineyards are all on the sides of these steep uh, hills on either side of the Mosul River. So here's one of my projects, um, renovation project, the ceiling plane, and this is you can see the before up above here with the pink walls. Uh, that ceiling's just about caving in. They're two by fours, spanning. 20 feet, more than a 20 foot span, two by fours, holding up an inch and a half of plaster. And then the ceiling, the, the attic was being used too. They're, they're lucky the ceiling didn't cave in on them. But now just regardless of the structural problems here, think of just the space, how cramped it is. And then you see how I uh, fixed that below. Uh, in the, with the blue walls, uh, so I built all that, engineered architect and builder. So this is what it looked like. Then I did this, uh, at, which is you know, structured. And I think I've got to think of the whole roof structure too. So essentially, I'm making trusses of sorts, uh, uh, you know, with pretty stiff moment connections. That, that there's no struts up there. I don't like to put struts. You know, if you make a truss, the problem the trusses are the struts, the, the between the, the the rafters and the floor joist part uh, can interfere with the floor space above if you're going to use it. Uh, make it difficult to put the floor in and just get in the way. 
Uh, and so this it is a truss, but with moment connections. The moment is a torque where the connection between the floor joist and the, the roof are beefed up so that it works as one continuous, one solid form of structure. And good beefy, good sized uh, floor too to hold up a load for storage above. No, no deflection. You want to use deflection as the ruling uh, criteria in structural design in a lot of cases, even though you design for you know for shear and for flexure and for compression and torsion, for you know failure prevention. Uh, that's critical, of course. But then the deflections end up ruling not just by code what's allowed, but you know beef it up a little more just so there's not perceived vibrations or any sag at all. You know, a little, even a little bit of deflection can crack your drywall joints and to make people uncomfortable when they're walking or more they're dancing or you know, doing something that you don't want to feel the floor. So, uh, a lot of finish work too. This was a quite a bit of work. You can see some of the details here. Details, ceiling plane, finishing that off. So more in ceiling plane. You put holes in the ceiling and skylights and you're certainly opening up the space and defining it in a completely different way. You let the sunlight in, and it's orchestrating. You're orchestrating the sun. Like in music, frankly, Wright would say orchestrate the sun in his organic architecture. So here's a project where I put these skylights in. Um, there was no southern facing. Now, typically, you don't want to put your skylights southern facing because of the heat gain and the glare. So I didn't even put mini blinds on these. But there, this was a somewhat dark room with only north, uh, a north face. And, a, and, and there was a western window, too, but it's somewhat blocked by a building up on a hill um, with sunlight. So this really let a lot of sun in. So you get a feel for that. Let's see how this changed the space. Also, um, I can't say Frank Led Wright gave me this idea or the, the Japanese design, but this is a common thing to do where you let the sun in, you let views, you frame views of the outside, but you provide privacy. So you don't put these windows all the way down to where people could see you from the outside, but you're, you know, you can see the outside's coming in, not just the sun, but the views also. Uh, and I had other work on this project too. I didn't take pictures of, we did bathrooms, uh, landscaping and things like that. So the, the, the form, color, texture, and pattern of the ceiling uh, can define the space as well as the quality of the light and sound within. These are acoustical clouds. Uh, I've taught a, a number of lectures on uh, architectural acoustics and did a little bit of consulting in the firm, San Francisco firm, where I did structural, mostly structural and environmental engineering and architecture. But this, uh, and that whole course in, in acoustics, it's not a trivial thing. Acoustical engineer is a field in itself. You get a PhD just in that, and you probably want to get a consultant that has that much education if they're designing an auditorium for you. Because it's not a trivial thing to design the acoustics well in a building. Talk about um, vertical elements now, columns, obelisks, towers. Uh, they generate a space around them just by virtue of sticking up out of the ground, out of the ground plane, the floor plane. This is a picture of me in Paris in 1992. I took my wife to Paris on her birthday. She was 27 years old. And um, this tower defines a space around it, beautiful park. Uh, at nighttime, it really defines a whole area of the city. Beautiful, beautiful city. I, I don't care much for the surrounding city of Paris other than the downtown. Uh, it's not very architecturally pleasing, uh, a little bit dangerous. Uh, the, Countryside in France. Uh, if you go to France, I highly recommend the countryside, the small towns, and then do a day trip or stay a couple nights. We stayed a couple nights in uh, that beautiful hotel right outside the Opera House. That's worth doing. But if you're going to immerse yourself in Europe, I recommend staying a week or two in the French countryside in little towns and then a couple days in the city to see the sights and feel Paris. Here's a tower in Zell, similar thing, uh, Germany, uh, 
1992. Uh, so now this is uh, Rome, a picture I took in 2011, and you see how it generates a space. Uh, the tower defines a space around it. And so the piazza, um, this is, this is uh, uh, St. Peter's you know, the Basilica, where the Pope gives his services and speeches. The Pope lives right here. This is Vatican, Vatican City, Swiss Guard. It's a separate place within Italy. It's its own thing. And it's certainly a space generated around this uh, obelisk. Oh, this is one of my favorite places, Piazza San Marco. Uh, the first time I went, made the mistake of staying right next to the this, and it was so crowded. Cruise ships come in. 15,000 people fit in this place. Don't do that. I mean, just avoid that. Uh, so even that first time we went, I took a student of mine. We were presenting at a conference, in, uh, a high-tech conference up in Genoa. And I took him down here. I actually started teaching him some urban design uh, as, as we sat there. Even though he wasn't an architecture student, he humored me. I give him lectures on urban design. This is a long time ago. Uh, but anyway, we, we, so we, we both were annoyed by all the crowds. And then we said, okay, let's just, what can we do? Let's avoid the day trippers that come in on the cruise ships and the trains, and we're staying right there. We'd get up just at sunrise. It was like around 6 a.m. Only photographers were out there. It's beautiful, empty piazza. And then we'd go and you know, go further away from this during the day or just take a nap and avoid the crowds and then come out around 11 at night. And then they have music playing all past midnight, several little bands. It's so big you could have you know beautiful little quartets or trios uh, in three different places, and the, and the music didn't interfere. A beautiful space. So anyway, uh, this, <clears throat> this uh, you can see now that um, if you move the tower off center, so you saw in St. Peter's Piazza, it was in the center and defined like a circular space. But no, this is a skew here. So when moved off center, its field becomes more aggressive and begins to compete for visual supremacy. Visual tension is created between the point and its field. Uh, this was in Narita in Japan, so we, you know, we flew into Japan. Uh, this was just an airport town that I didn't think would be that beautiful because it's, you know, by definition, an airport town. But it's 60 miles outside of Tokyo, New Tokyo Airport. Everybody flies into Narita. And I recommend staying there. Just a beautiful, huge, you know, couple hundred acre Japanese garden, an old town. Um, but anyway, so this vertical element defines uh, a space. This is the Shinto Shrine. Japanese are... Uh, both Shinto and Buddhist, and the, the shrines are Shinto. Buddhism's, Buddhism's more way of life, and monks and monasteries. And, although you see Shinto shrines, with, you know, uh, to the spirits uh, in the Buddhist temples and everywhere else. Uh, you see this tower rising up. This is one of 60 sites preserved in Kyoto, great historic town. And one site is, you know, many buildings. This is one. Well, I'm, I'm talking about Kyoto. This is actually Narita. So, sorry, this is Narita, and uh, uh, you know, I'd say equally beautiful, not on the same scale as Kyoto, but highly preserved all around here. Now, this is Osaka. Osaka is the second largest city in Japan. This is where I was a keynote speaker, and they, you know, they put me up in a nice hotel and really nice dinner with sashimi and Kobe beef. And, they treated us very nicely. My son was on the stage with me because he contributed. Uh, we, we spent a little time here, but we re really were hoping to get to Kyoto as fast as possible. Uh, the conference organizers were a little annoyed that I didn't stay a little longer on either side of the, my talk. It stayed a couple days, but they wanted me to tra travel with everybody. Uh, but I, I, I kind of wanted to be on my own doing historic uh, discovery of Kyoto. So we stayed, my son and I, two weeks in Kyoto. But anyway, this, these are two trees sticking up out of a park in Osaka. It certainly defines that space, and it complements the buildings around it. It's a very unique design. Trees certainly create uh, points. Uh, this is on the uh, this is in Oahu, so on the way back from Japan on this trip. We stayed in Hawaii. I almost moved to Hawaii several times. I had a couple job offers in 88. Starting my high tech career, almost went here. Uh, both building related things, a structural one and an environmental one. Uh, 
Um, we, we didn't we didn't care for the housing on Oahu at that time, and plus we had a little kitty cat, our practice baby, and you have to quarantine your cat for six months. Uh, the, the islands are very careful about letting in uh, different diseases and species, and, and uh, as you imagine, uh, um, they have no snakes apparently, and. Uh, so uh, yeah, anyway, that that was the story, and, and we've been back several times. I like Oahu because it uh, has a city, and the University of Hawaii architecture uh, programs is very nice, and <clears throat> and the culture and the people, it's a little more real. Uh, we've been to Maui a couple times, and that's um, that's more of a vacation kind of place. It's it's livable, and Kauai is actually very beautiful. Half of the island is like the Grand Canyon, which you wouldn't imagine, uh, but it's, a, it's the Garden Island, and I haven't been to the Big Island. And this is a place we stayed up near the Brigham Young University campus in Hawaii, on the north east side of Oahu. Rented a little bungalow. It was kind of dark though, because the mountain blocked a lot of the sun. But, it, it, you know, it was beautiful when the sun managed to get to us, which was a lot of the time. So towers, vertical elements. So originally this is Windsor Castle. Windsor, uh, you know, was, it was a castle. That round part was to protect against uh, warring uh, in feudal times, dark ages, medieval times <clears throat> in Europe. Uh, this is... Eton College, it's actually a high school. And this is my 21st year at Elizabethtown College as I record this lecture. I, mean, I made this lecture in 2019, but I'm recording it 2020 with audio. So Eton College, this is where all the princes and, you know, it's right next to Windsor Castle. So all the Windsor children, Prince Charles, and everybody goes here. It was kind of cool. It was very cool. Uh, so now vertical elements, you can create a virtual wall, a plane, just by virtue of a cascade, a colonnade. So you're maintaining uh, an indoor-outdoor flow, but you have a boundary. It's penetrable, but it's still a boundary. So you're defining the space, the edge of the space. Took this picture in Paris in '92. Also, Paris '92 colonnade of trees can have the same effect. Uh, this is in uh, what year was this? Uh, oh, 2008. Also went back 2009 as a visiting professor and stayed for almost a month. And, uh, but the, this is the first time there. That's my student David Coleman. He went on to get his master's and PhD, actually connected with people. We had an eight hour banquet and the dean of his graduate school just happened to be there and gave him a full scholarship just because we got to know him for eight hours and uh, he got his master's. And uh, I don't normally drink, but I think I drank two bottles of wine by myself over eight hours. Uh, it, and that's where I got to know my professor friend and then that led to a visiting professorship. And now they're really good friends. We just visited my wife and children, uh, their family, his wife and children who I had visited before with my son and by myself, but this time whole family kind of get together in Venice in a residential neighborhood of locals. Oh, the colonnade, this is again Piazza San Marco in uh, Venice, Venezia. Oh, this is from 2004, this is my first trip to Italy. Uh, <clears throat> I thought people would speak English more, and I thought I'd teach myself Italian on the some on the way. And now I speak, uh, I don't know, about 800 words and a little bit of grammar. I still don't sound like a local, but I, I can understand what they're saying, and they can understand me if everybody speaks slow enough. Oh, this is beautiful, and this is Rovereto. This is very we're just south of Trento, where the conference was originally, and then where I taught. Uh, this is a beautiful region up up in the highlands uh, on the foothills of the Alps on the Italy side. Uh, also Austria borders there. The Brenner Pass, very famous. Uh, the only way for 
troops and Roman times to the world wars to get through. It's a huge uh, gap between the Alps. And, uh, and the Alps, you won't think is, you know, compared to the Rockies, the overall altitude is not that high, but the relief is really dramatic. And uh, I drove over the Alps from Zurich once to go teach in Trento. It took me 10 hours, <clears throat> 10 hours of driving. Go back on, you know, take the Autostrada. It's the Australian, Austrian version of the auto, German Autobahn. It's like five and a half hours. If you want to go from Zurich to Italy, driving, I, I recommend trains. I normally always take trains. But this is another colonnade. Uh, this is in Rome, beautiful sycamores. Everything's so well done, most of Italy. Most of the historic things. Not everything. Here's a colonnade in Mons, Belgium. I already talked about that. Here's another colonnade in Kyoto, in the neighborhood we stayed. This canal really defined the neighborhood. It fed into a bigger river. Uh, we found, uh, if you ever watch a movie with uh, Marlon Brando called Sayonara, and it says it's all filmed in other locations in Japan, but we, my son and I, we know it had to be filmed right here. If you look where the, his friend's house is, you'll see this canal. Well, you maybe have to be there to appreciate it. But. A colonnade, this is Buddhist temple in Kyoto. Uh, vertical elements defining the space. So um, now you make a canopy with your four posts and you can have a ceremonial kind of space defined around that. This is in Kyoto defining the space with the vertical elements of the columns defining that space, as well as the overhead plane. Uh, the trees in a grove. This is uh, the bungalow in Oahu we stayed. And my wife and daughter met us here, and my son and I are way back from Japan. Uh, there's the thickness of the, the jungle in uh, Hawaii. Uh, this is, if you look carefully here, these are very poisonous. You see those wires? Those, are, those round things are eggs, and that centipede is pretty nasty. It's white. This is the Johnson Wax Building by Frank Lloyd Wright in Wisconsin. Uh, these col columns are very controversial. You can see in other courses I teach about uh, how he was questioned by engineers at the time. Uh, then he made a mock-up and loaded the thing twice as, with twice the weight that it would carry under design load. Still didn't fail. And then he said, add a whole bunch more. And uh, uh, many, much more load went on before it actually did fail. But you can see how these vertical elements define this space, as, as well as the lily pad kind of effect that he's doing above with those skylights. Um, that whole area in between is skylights made of plastic tubing, a pretty innovative use of materials. Uh, vertical elements and the, uh, the grid defining the space. So this is a floor plan of a typical uh, a curtain wall of the high rise building. Uh, where you make a shell and then you build out with tenant improvements. This is the kind of thing I did uh, for developers in Texas and California. We built shells and then uh, with the space planners and designers, uh, pick, uh, design the interior space each time there was a tenant, give them so much of a square foot allowance of tenant improvements. And they'd use that to build out their space. You build the shell first with a central core and curtain wall exterior. So we're talking about the vertical elements here, defining the space, um, and a grid. And so um, there's a number of different things. A lot of Corbusier's uh, can be attributed to a lot of the some of the original, uh, let's say high rises, but uh, it, mostly the large apartment building uh, project complexes. I don't care for so much. It's interesting what he did at first and his modular design concepts, um, certainly architecture theory is worth noting, 
but uh, it led to a lot of uh, inner city housing projects and Soviet type housing, which I think is somewhat impersonal, not human scale. I mean, interiors are meant to be, if you look at our uh, Cabuzio's theory, but then you, if you ever walk through some of these spaces, in these you know, high rise housing projects, you may think differently. The shape, color, and pattern of the wall can determine how much of the separation or a unifying element it is between two spaces. The height of the wall certainly can affect whether it's uh, used as a seating uh, element or whether or not you can see over it and how that affects the connectivity between the spaces or if it obstructs your vision, how much of an enclosure it makes of the space you're in. The color texture and pattern of the plane also affects your perception of the visual weight scale and proportion and where the plane is with respect to uh, volumes of space uh, where, where that wall is uh, affects the connectivity between the two uh, whether it's uh, uh, connecting them or separating them A wall plane, when a wall is uh, standing alone, like this arch, this is the entrance to the Colosseum in Rome. Uh, it's me standing there in 2011. And um, uh, so, uh, you know, a single plane can, uh, uh, with, with some penetrations, can define the gateway, the entrance to uh, an area. So the wall plane is certainly critical in defining our space as well as the ceiling plane. The exterior facade wall planes can define the interior as well as the interior defining the exterior. So you can imagine the space within defined by this exterior wall. And so here's an example of how that curved exterior wall defines the interior space. So the castle in Belgium. Here's me looking out the window of that castle and a picture of the ceiling. And here you can see how that curved wall defines the exterior architecture of the castle. So a wall certainly has more of a presence than a colonnade in defining the edges of the space. And when combined with a floor plane and a ceiling plane, it's uh, defining its uh, space very unique. Uh, you can see how it can be passive as a backdrop. Uh, you don't want the, your gallery walls to be too profound. The Guggenheim is sometimes uh, criticized because it's the building itself is what people are going to see a lot, and your uh, your your galleries should be focused or should focus the attention of the visitors on the exhibits. So you know, for the most part, you want it to be a backdrop. Uh, or, you know, can it insert itself as a form in itself here, these, the way these walls are done? Uh, something that's drawing your attention to those shapes. Uh, if you do an accent wall, certainly can uh, uh, have an effect in itself of defining uh, a unique element within the space. Accent wall. Imagine if that was white, how that would be different. It asserts itself, asserts itself. Accent wall. Even if you just texture it, it's still different. Even though it's the same color. Now this is actually a partition wall, but it's still an accent wall. So wall plan, here's a design of mine in uh, California, in San Diego. Uh, I was a professor of mine. He was uh, my urban uh, design history professor. Uh, he's from Italy. He's Italian and grew, uh, went to the University of Florence, which later visited. And so he let me design and renovate his house and stay in it for a couple months. Uh, Simultaneous to other things I was doing. Well, it was between, it was in the summer, so I didn't have uh, the urban design courses at the time. Um, 
but I was working at the Planning Commission all around this time. <coughs> so I made just a little quick model. He, he's an architect, so I didn't do, need to do too much. And then uh, most of the work here after the initial design was in the carpentry. So you see uh, the details there. And this is all my design. He let me do that even though he's an architect. Uh, no, I certainly had some say over what, whether or not what I was doing was good. So be both he and his wife were pretty happy with the end results here. Um, this is in the 1980s, where this you know, maybe this color scheme's not so relevant today, but this was what in the 80s this was pretty fashionable, and I still I think it stood the test of time. Uh, also uh, worked around a fireplace here, made a curved wall, a curved bench. So curving wall. It's not a trivial thing to curve a wall. So, you know, I had to score and wet the sheetrock and do it in several layers of thin quarter inch sheetrock and you know, lay out the studs accordingly. Get a nice even curve. Here are some final pictures I took, uh, or the, on the right, the last picture just before we moved away from San Diego. Um, I lived there for about three years and then we lived up to San Francisco a couple years. And my wife and I were just moving up there. I was getting these final pictures at the end here. And it was a roll of film that uh, back in the days we have a roll of film and a camera. You couldn't see the picture until you sent it away and waited a week or so for it to get developed and come back in the mail. Unfortunately, it cut off the top here. So that's what it says. Last photo on a roll of film caused image exposure defect. And so there's a somewhat before and after kind of thing. You can see an you know, old crappy door I took off, put on a new door, uh, mortised in the hinges and the lock set, uh, bevel the edge. <clears throat> so more into finding the space here. So an L-shaped configuration can define a space uh, uh, you know, with, a, with a solid corner. Um, and then if you separate that corner, make it not a fixed corner, uh, one of the arms can incorporate the corner while the other is seen as an appendage. So it's an interesting way to play with the form. Now, you can just do that with a door, but if you move the whole wall, it has a different effect. So defining space, uh, a void is introduced to one side of the corner of the configuration. And uh, uh, the definition of the field will be weakened. The two planes will be isolated from each other and one will appear to slide by and visually dominate the other. So you see how just opening up that corner affects the space uh, on the top set, top pair of pictures. And if you open up uh, the corner by pulling both walls back, that's a completely different way the space is now defined. Not just at the corner, but the whole interior space within. So you can play with the way you define spaces and uh, you know, come very rapidly through this. This is really should be a two part lecture series. It should take two different hours to look at this. I'm going through fast so it can store as one solid thing. I'll come back and look at these things. Um, the corner can be an independent element that joins the two planes. Post. Uh, parallel planes define a space, a corridor. See the way these units fly out. Come back, take a look at that. Um, this is in Milan. I didn't take this picture, but uh, I've been to Milan. Um, my favorite city, uh, you know, the Lake Districts north of it, I think are beautiful. Um, I, other cities I like better. But you can see how this space is defined with these planes. If you put three walls together and make a pocket, uh, it defines, kind of captures that space. If you put something for it to focus uh, when you're in it, looking out, like an obelisk, uh, then that can uh, certainly enhance that space and give a, a greater sense of closure. And of course, four planes, uh, walls define a space well-defined enclosed space. 
I do come back and take a look at these and digest them. We're going very fast, so the properties of the closure and the quality of the space and how each one of those varies. Uh, in the form of the building both impacts and is influenced by the nature of the site and context, always, always. Not just Frank Lloyd Wright organic architecture, all architecture should be that way. Uh, respond to the structures, the topography, uh, and the spatial conditions. So you see an urban scale, urban design, cascade of buildings, and then one building how it affects another's backdrop, uh, how a corner two two buildings can define a space, a piazza down below or in, you know, in the pocket, uh, magnify an object within. Uh, this is San Francisco. My sister, actually, when we lived in San Francisco, was right to the right here in one of these houses. Not one of these, but two houses over. Uh, this is a beautiful San Francisco uh, cascade of buildings, um, designing a fabric, continuity buildings. This is the Guggenheim, Frank Lloyd Wright, um, and you can see uh, and there's Central Park and uh, how the buildings around it create a backdrop for it. And it was actually, there's a, the addition, the building immediately adjacent to it, uh, that was the thought process. That went up after the Guggenheim, but the idea was not to, uh, to overshadow it. Although, I don't, still don't care for it, but the real, real estate's so expensive that you know something's going to go. Now this is a space on the Elizabethtown College campus, an outdoor space defined by these two dormitories. And I brought this up uh, through a couple of different administrations and the college and working with different senior staff and the trustees and some committees and my students certainly over a number of years. Uh, and um, this space uh, you can see in the bottom left hand corner, that's Alpha Hall, which is the administrative building with the president and all the senior staff and, the, and our beautiful library up on the left. And then there's a parking lot here. Oh, oh and there's also a, a nice garden that was donated by some of the graduating students uh, one year. You can see right uh, to the left of the parking lot. But then that parking lot, and it's not a lot of vehicles, uh, really disrupts this space. And in my opinion, what could be a better use uh, for this uh, area, potentially new quad. And nobody uses the uh, ornamental garden probably because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just next to the parking lot. Um, but imagine that whole quad as one green space. And maybe if you want to make you know, good academic use out of it, put a little amphitheater in there or uh, you know, even a, a water feature gathering kind of place, a gathering uh, focal point. So, you know, I've discussed this with students over the years. Um, <clears throat> could do much more right in here. Some more pictures of that space. So facades serve as walls that define courtyards, streets, public gathering places. Yes, the walls define the outdoor spaces as well. So the way a piazza or you know, a courtyard is defined um, by the adjacent buildings. Certainly Piazza San Marco, the Basilica of San Marco and the Logia, I believe it's called. It was a government center. This was a, the center of all activity uh, after the, during some of the Middle Ages were uh, dangerous to go by land a lot of the times and people lived in castles and things. And then coming out of that in the Renaissance, the trade routes and the waterways were, were vital. And so this was a, a serious center of world governance in the Western world. So Piazza San Marco again. Can't get enough of that. I don't get tired of looking at pictures of this. Hopefully you don't either. So building design. Uh, at the scale of the building site, a building can form a wall along an edge, define outdoor space, merge uh, interior space and private outdoor space in the walled site. See that in a number of warmer climates, also in the Japanese design and Chinese design, um, and frankly, the right design. Some. A close a portion of the site as an outdoor room, an L shape, or just completely surrounded as a courtyard.
You can see this dating back to Roman times, uh, Chinese times, 2,000 years ago, uh, and uh, Spanish times too. Um, <clears throat> the scale of mosaic building can dominate the site through its form. It can stretch out and present a broad face to address a view. It can stand free within its site, but extend its exterior space to merge the private exterior space. And it could stand as a positive form in a negative space. So here are some examples of these forms. Wall uh, helping to find the outdoor space. A couple walls defining this space. L-shaped uh, forms defining this pool area. An indoor-outdoor kind of field defined here. You find this in the Japanese and frankly, right, and other things in the Ngawa and Barandas. Uh, this is in uh, four walls. Certainly make a, a plaza, piazza, a courtyard, is Padua. A single wall. Uh, this is a curved uh, crescent building in England. Very famous uh, building defining this uh, whole area in front of the building by virtue of its curved shape. Uh, this is Monticello in Virginia. Virginia. I've been there a number of times since 35 years ago. This is a famous design uh, on top of a hill. And he also designed the University of Virginia, you see off to the left. Uh, this building dominating the site on the top of the hill. Not something Frank Lloyd Wright would have done in his organic design. He would build into that hill, uh, like in Taliesin, which means shining brow, and many others. Uh, Levittown after World War II, GI Bill, everybody mass-produced housing, everybody gets a house, and, and so here you can see the building uh, can stand as a positive form in a negative space. Uh, two the parallel planes, floor and ceiling, certainly something you see Frank Lloyd Wright doing with the cruciform and the, uh, and the prairie style. So we see that these two planes, uh, parallel planes, form a spatial zone between them and this is noted in Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water uh, from our book by Francis Ching. Uh, the reinforced concrete slabs of falling water express the horizontality of the floor and roof uh, planes as they can lever outward from the central vertical core. And here's a quote from Frank Lloyd Wright from his book The Natural House. I had an idea that the planes parallel to the earth and buildings identify themselves with the ground. I began to see a building as a broad shelter in the open, related to vista, vista without, and vista within. I was born an American child of the ground and space, welcoming spaciousness as a modern human need. The farm had no negligible share in developing this sense of things in me, I am sure. He grew up on the Wisconsin, Wisconsin farms, farmland. Some pictures I found of different seasons, uh, just off the internet, uh, looking for seasonal pictures of falling water. Complements the site all four seasons. Spring also, summer. A field trip, we cover in other classes. I talk about my Frank Lloyd Wright series. Uh, took the students there. Number of faculty involved. You may recognize some of them. The field trip, again, we talk about this much in other lectures, series, my lecture series in Franklin Wright. Then uh, the perceived volume by virtue of, uh, this is in Kyoto, the columns and beams forming perceived volume. Uh, the skeleton beneath the skin, there's a whole lecture that I do just on this. I have students make barns just uh, so you perceive the skeleton and, and the perceived volume by virtue of the skeleton. Uh, this project I talk about, this is one of my projects, my most recent project, uh, and other lectures. And certainly all the framing, old and new, the bones of the building, the skeleton of the building, define the volume within. Some details of the barn structure I had to beef up and what I'm doing with the barn. And so now windows, you want to pay close attention to how the windows affect uh, light. So openings connect space to its context. 
Uh, windows allow daylight to penetrate and illuminate off, the, off of views, relationship with the adjacency of spaces. Ventilation, very important nowadays, fresh air. Um, doorways offer an entry and influence patterns of movement within. Uh, one single opening won't weaken an edge or a sense of enclosure. Multiple openings can, can do that. Uh, but they can also form a unified composition uh, or be staggered to disperse and create visual movement along the plane. Um, as the opening increases in size, it at some point cease to be uh, a figure within an enclosed field and become an element in itself. So a band of windows is actually uh, a thing in itself. Um, and then horizontal opening extending across the wall begins to, visual, uh, to visually lift the ceiling plane uh, from the wall and gives it a feeling of lightness. So you're affecting the entire volume of the space and the, and the feeling of the ceiling as well. Here's a picture from uh, my project here. I'm capturing the views and it's certainly an element itself. Uh, this banding of windows, uh, perhaps thought of from Frank Lloyd Wright 50 years ago when I first looked into this stuff. And, and, uh, and growing up on the Philadelphia Main Line, looking at the English Tudor mansions where they do this also, long before Frank Lloyd Wright's time. Well, the, the mansions were uh, done right at the same time as Frank Lloyd Wright, but the English Tudor that was inspired by is uh, long before that, a couple hundred years before that. Nevertheless, it's, a, I think, a very good architectural thing to do. Uh, and then more on these windows. A window wall allows more daylight and views and visually expands the space beyond physical boundaries. So you inside, outside, like Japanese Igawa, like Franklin Wright organic design, and like what I like to do. Opening along edges visually weakens corners uh, as openings increase. So you know, destroy the box if that's what you're going for. That's what Franklin Wright wants to do. And so he had many corner windows with no mullions, you know, uh, in between. And that's uh, quite a feat of craftsmanship. Uh, then locating a skylight along the edge where a uh, wall and ceiling planes meet allows daylight to wash the surface wall, illuminate it, and enhance the brightness of the space. Be careful doing a little bit too much of that. Uh, at some point, the, build, the, the space no longer functions or is perceived as a separate space. Um, combining a window wall with a large skylight obscures the boundaries between the inside and outside, and the building loses its sense of enclosure. Yes. So the Angawa, again, we're going very rapidly through this lecture. Come back and uh, look at this if you haven't already been assigned to watch. This is a very good uh, Japanese uh, television video on the Angawa, the enclosed porch space. More than that, it's part of the building. It's not just enclosing a porch. The, the, the partitions in the walls, the screens, allow for an open floor plan. So it's really a continuation of interior space into the exterior. So again, frankly, Wright would often say, destroy the box, open up, uh, open up the space. Uh, in both the in interior walls and exterior. Like this, this is an amazing feat of craftsmanship. Now this has been reconstructed after uh, the structural retrofitting, uh, the post-tension of slabs. And so perhaps this seam wasn't as seamless in the 1930s when it was first made. But this is, a, you know, even today, quite a feat to have. You cannot see that seam. You can't even perceive, perceive that corner seam in that glass. That's pretty amazing craftsmanship. Uh, so here's another cascade of windows. And a similar thing I'm doing in my house. Again, not directly uh, influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright, but who knows, maybe I saw something in the 50 years ago that reminded me to do this. It just seemed like a great idea to frame the views. And then light, and the way you deal with light is very important. So you reveal shapes, colors, and textures, uh, shifting patterns of light, shade, shadows, sunlight articulates the form. The sun animates the space. Uh, the color and brilliance of the sunlight can create festive atmosphere, right? The feeling of the space. A room full of more diffused light can be somber. So what effect are you going for? Is this a library? Is this a living room? Is this a kitchen? A breakfast nook? Maybe you want to put on the east side of the house where the sun rises and it, it's a bright thing. Or on the west side, you know, as you're relaxing after work or school, you want it maybe a little more somber. 
or in a church setting? How do you, how do you want to play with that light? Direct sunlight creates sharp patterns of light and dark and, the, and articulates the, the form very crisply. Uh, the shape of the opening also um, is reflected in the cast shadow that's created. Uh, the color and texture of forms and surfaces affect the re reflectivity and ambient light level within the space. So that's very important. Uh, you can do light tunnels, bringing in light into the buildings. You can play with reflectance to either bring in more sunlight or actually reduce heat gain. Learn about that in green architectural engineering. And what are you trying to do? And the reflectance of the surfaces, both interior and exterior, as you tra channel light into the building, as well as heat, um, what are you going for? In Arizona, you don't want to bring in the direct sunlight heat in the middle of the day. Perhaps in the north you do want to do that more. So we will also learn to control the light in courses uh, such as my green architectural engineering course where uh, you want to modulate and even with mechanical controls at times the amount of light coming in for heat gain, uh, the sunlight, natural daylight, wh whether you want it in or not depending if it's creating glare or if it's diffused, what side of the building it's on, what time of year it is, and, uh, and same with the heat gain. And uh, in general, for, for studios, architecture studios and art studios, you want to design them, and create those studios in uh, with northern light, uh, with northern windows, north-facing windows, because then that light is not so variable. You have a consistent uh, non-glare kind of diffused light coming in. So even if the forms themselves aren't part of uh, what's letting the light in, there can be shadows created that enhance or detract from the architecture. Uh, the quality of the sunlight, um, uh, and whether it's diffused or not, or, or direct, varies by time of day, season, place, uh, where you are in the globe, the latitude of your location, uh, the sun angles and the different seasons where the sun rises and sets. You may want the sun coming in in the morning in the breakfast nook. You may want it in the east and you may want the sunset uh, viewed out your living room windows in the west. You got to be careful with solar heat gain through the west as well as the south. The south certainly is where the, the abundance of sun is, but there's a thermal lag we'll learn about in the courses such as green architectural engineering where the building will heat up over the day and actually can get the hottest if there's too much western fenestration, too much, too many windows on the western elevation of the building. Uh, and as sunlight is dispersed by clouds, haze, and pre precipitation to transmit the changing colors of the sky and the weather to the forms and surfaces, it illuminates. So you may want those colors of the sunset coming in, uh, depending on how you're orchestrating the sunlight and bringing it into your building. Uh, there's beautiful sunsets in the desert and uh, Texas and Arizona. Uh, but again, be careful of how much fenestration you have on that western wall because those are very high heat gain places. So you may have a beautiful, beautiful sunset to watch, but you may be baking in the space uh, because you let too much sunlight in. So be careful with that and, uh, and think about the colors. In the, in the morning, uh, it's different too, that, that you don't have that thermal gain of the daylight. Uh, heating up the building. So maybe you want the direct sunlight coming in in the morning, maybe to wake you up in the bedroom, maybe in the breakfast nook, and, and the colors of the sunrise too. So the different size of the opening can affect the amount of light, heat, and sound you let in. We talk about acoustics too in, um, in a number of my courses in green architectural engineering and other courses too. It's an architectural as well as engineering concept. And um, and how does that affect the space? So these, these openings uh, seriously affect the, the space in many, many ways. I already mentioned in this project of mine, uh, orchestrating the sun as well as the thermal and natural daylighting effects uh, varied per season uh, based on the orientation of the sun and the placement and the height of the windows. Uh, windows and skylights establish a relationship between a room and its surroundings. Japanese would certainly agree with the Ngawa, frankly, right, organic architecture as well. 
uh, windows, uh, window and skylights establish a relationship between the surroundings, yes. Uh, a small opening can be like a painting on, on the wall. A group of windows, if they're apart, can uh, invoke a sense of movement between spaces, outdoor spaces. A long, narrow opening up high um, can uh, hint at what's beyond and give you some views while maintaining privacy. So the, the opening, as it gets bigger, can uh, dominate the space you're within. You may not want to do it so much in an inner city down on the first floor looking out on the street, but if you have some nice views you want to bring in uh, or in a garden, then certainly. Uh, the second picture here, you can direct the viewer by strategically putting the window in a certain place. And then the third picture, the bay window is nice if it projects out, actually allow people to sit and feel like they're part of the outside space, maybe with a window bench. Again, here's my most recent Pennsylvania project as I'm framing the views of the neighboring farmland. Again, capturing the views here of the, of the sky as well as, as, well as the uh, this 200 acre farmland Amish right over there and they out that window uh, they plow that with a mule team very picturesque uh, this is details you can come back in later if you're in the architecture theory class you want to certainly this is an assignment for you but to design a grand uh, window now Frank Lloyd Wright's organic design is something you definitely want to think about in detail. And so this is now an accumulation of many years of, uh, of, uh, of, of readings and experiences and my uh, interpretation of Frank Lloyd Wright's organic design, organic architecture design principles. And you'll see that I put an asterisk next to the ones that I um, have demonstrated in this uh, lecture that you just listened to. So I won't go through all of these here because this is covered in Frank Lloyd Wright uh, lecture series I have uh, and uh, it takes more than just a quick couple minutes to look at. And uh, there's a whole lecture series here of uh, you know, seven, eight hours of things, actually more like 20 if you take your time going through them, even though I narrate very quickly. And part of that you'll see uh, his childhood, his formative years, and influences that I note, and all the references that go into that lecture series, as well as the seven architecture courses I've taught, actually nine depending on how you count it, but seven certainly different courses, and also my YouTube channel where you'll find this lecture uh, among many other things. So this is the last slide. Uh, looks like it took a hour and 18 minutes, a little bit over, uh, to go through this. All this very quick. You really should do this in two parts. Uh, break it in half and, and go through slowly. Use the PowerPoint uh, PPTX with audio is my uh, advice for your first choice because then you can stop and go to links. You can certainly do the PDF too, but then you don't have the audio with that. And if you do the MP4, you're not going to have the links. Uh, or on YouTube either. So uh, my recommendation is the PPTX with audio. Uh, it'll take a little while to download, but it'll uh, be a more uh, rewarding experience. Um, <clears throat> and so this again is the end of uh, part three on architectural design theory lecture series uh, on form and space, this particular lecture.